I'm Dr. Todd Lizon from Lifestyle Integration and NIR Saunas. It's come to my attention recently through multiple comments, emails, other videos that there's a lot of confusion still about what near-infrared lamp saunas really are. Recently, a video was posted, and I want to make sure I get it right, it's called Near-Infrared Bulbs are Bad Source for Getting Near Wavelengths. This video, to its credit, uses some wonderful actual technology to assess the near-infrared wavelengths that are coming off of the infrared bulbs, and I encourage everyone to watch this video. However, there is more to the story than what this particular author is fully disclosing, and that's what I want this video to come and make clear. Now, with these near-infrared saunas, the questions and the comments and the concerns that I get are almost always about two things, wavelengths and dose. Let's have a look at these two things. First, let's talk about wavelengths. In the literature, we typically acknowledge that the wavelengths that are therapeutic are roughly in the red, red, wait, red wavelengths and in the near-infrared wavelengths frequencies, about 830 nanometers. Now what the science is typically doing is using lasers or LEDs which zone in on one single frequency. That's great. It's not what nature does though. What nature does through the sun is give you all the different wavelengths from 680 red wavelengths all the way right up through each and every one into mid-infrared mid and then into far-infrared. So these bulbs that we use have actually been studied. Now this is the Philips near-infrared therapeutic bulbs. They're a little bit different to the bulbs that we use in the near-infrared saunas in that they are more finely tuned to the near-infrared side of things and they have a peak around 1000 nanometers but the point is they have looked at these bulbs and they do produce near-infrared and red wavelengths. They're not all condensed into one single wavelength, so they're not necessarily going to be as therapeutic as a concentrated LED or laser, and I acknowledge that, and I think that's where some of the confusion comes regarding wavelengths. The next issue really is about dose, and that's what I want to speak the most about. With dose, there's a lot more to the story than that author let on, and I have a paper here and it's entitled Infrared and Skin, Friend or Foe. And it's by, one of the co-authors is Michael Hamblin, who is a world-renowned expert on photobiomodulation or PBM. If anyone is going to know anything about photobiomodulation, Michael Hamblin is definitely one of the world experts. And in his paper, we're talking about dose, in his paper he states that the wavelength, or the, I should, I should back up a little bit, in the video that the YouTube author was putting online, he clearly shows that the irradiance or power density of the near-infrared bulbs is only about 15 megawatts per square centimeter. In the video, he states accurately, because I have looked at the papers and read the, read the research as well, he accurately states that the accepted minimum therapeutic dose is 40 to 50 milliwatts per square centimeter. Interesting, because it would appear, and the conclusion that they came to, is that obviously the near-infrared lamps should not be considered therapeutic. I disagree. I'm going to show you why. We come back to the paper by Michael Hamblin. He states, clearly, the research shows that sun, the sun's natural irradiance or power density for near-infrared wavelengths is only 20 milliwatts per square centimeter. 20. So the dilemma is, how can we get our near-infrared light naturally? So an alternative question to, is the minimum therapeutic dose 40 to 50 milliwatts per square centimeter? The alternative question is, how are we supposed to get our near-infrared exposure? Let's look at this and use the brain as an example. With the brain, it's accepted in the literature that 20 milliwatts per square centimeter is not going, or even 15 milliwatts, but 20 milliwatts, the sun's natural irradiance, is not going to be strong enough to penetrate the brain. 
If it's not strong enough to penetra penetrate the brain, and the brain has chromophores for near infrared light, how is the brain functioning? This is a great question and is going to lead to the two things that have been left out of this video that I've been referencing. And one is indirect stimulation, and two is cumulative dose. Let's talk about indirect stimulation first. In another paper called, make sure I get this right, Turning on Lights to Stop Neurodegeneration, the Potential of Near-Infrared Light Therapy in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's Disease, they talk about indirect stimulation. And there's a couple of lines that I want to read to make sure that you understand this. So what science has done is they've basically said, here's the minimum dose that you need, 40 to 50 milliwatts per square centimeter, apply it directly at the tissue that's in need, and that's photobiomodulation, and that's accurate. But the problem with the brain is penetrating the skull. And we know that naturally there are all these chromophores inside the brain, but the sunlight can't penetrate the brain. So how's it working? Indirect stimulation. And what they've figured out is that you do not need to shine the light directly on the tissue involved. It's fascinating, and I'll read a couple of things from this paper. It says, for example, neuroprotection of the mouse brain against MPTP insult has been demonstrated following the remote application of near-infrared to the dorsum, the dorsum is the back, of the animal with no direct application to the head. That's really interesting. They go on to say, the phenomenon of indirect near-infrared induced neuroprotection is likely to involve the same mechanisms at a cellular level as those that provide neuroprotection to damaged cells with direct near-infrared stimulation. So here you have a clinical research paper, a relatively new paper, that's saying indirect stimulation works the same, perhaps not as effectively though, as direct stimulation. That is really interesting because it means that lower amounts can work. You can stimulate by getting exposed to, for example, natural sunlight or the near-infrared from the lamps. You can get that exposure to near-infrared and have a therapeutic benefit because of indirect stimulation absorbed through the skin superficially, not all that deeply, and then there's a communication mechanism to help the brain. So indirect stimulation is a huge factor in understanding how near-infrared lamp saunas actually can and do provide photobiomodulation benefits, although not as effectively as the actual LED or laser therapeutic devices. The next bit on dose is absolutely the bit that I need to correct the video author on in understanding how photobiomodulation has its effects. This paper here is called The Relevance of Accurate Comprehensive Treatment Parameters in Photobiomodulation, and it talks about cumulative dose, which has not been mentioned in almost any of the literature that I look at, certainly none of the videos online, they don't talk about cumulative dose, they talk about just the actual therapeutic dose, not cumulative dose. Let's explain what it is. In this study here, they had two treatment diodes and they used LED lights in these diodes. And in these diodes, they had, I believe, 36 diodes in one of the applicators and 36 diodes in the other. So the therapeutic one had all 36 on. The placebo one only had one of the diodes on because they wanted it to look like it was on to, tr to trick the patient so that, or the trick the um, clinician to try to keep it as a, as a placebo, as a blind study. Now, the one single diode had an irradiance or power density of less than one milliwatt per square centimeter. Less than one milliwatt. Now remember, they're saying the therapeutic amount is 50 to 60 or even far more, but the sun's natural irradiance is only 20, and the lamp's natural irradiance is only about 15. So this one is less than one. And what happened is, they found that, the, and they were looking at ulcers on skin, they found that of course the 36 diodes that had the therapeutic amount, and their applicator was using um, 100 milliwatts per square centimeter. They found that the ulcers healed much quicker using that, but the interesting thing was, they found that after 45, and I'll read it, after the initial 45 days of treatment during which placebo-treated ulcers worsened, 
the ulcers began to hear, heal virtually as nicely as those in the real treatment group did from the very beginning. This finding suggests that once the total amount of energy, that is energy delivered at each treatment session multiplied by the total number of treatments reached a certain threshold, the so-called placebo treatment began to engender positive healing. In other words, cumulative dose is therapeutic. There's no such thing as placebo photobiomodulation. If you're applying near-infrared light or red light to the skin, you're getting a cumulative dose. So when you use the near-infrared saunas on a regular, ongoing basis, you're getting far less than the so-called therapeutic dose. But the cumulative effect is essentially the same as the therapeutic effect. Now, more research needs to be done. Obviously, things need to be looked at in greater detail, but this is really important to understand in understanding that near-infrared saunas work very well when it comes to photobiomodulation. Now, I get a couple of other concerns and questions as well. And some of the concerns and questions I get is that LEDs and lasers are different and that you're referencing studies that show you know, laser effects, but you're only using near-infrared lamps. So how can you say that that's accurate? Well, by physics basically dictates the answer to this really, really simply. And the answer is a photon is a photon. You see, the laser people used to have the same argument against the LED people. They used to say that LED lights don't work as good as lasers, and that was proven to be inaccurate. And it's the same argument here. The LED laser people are saying the near-infrared lamps don't work the same, but they do. A photon is a photon. Another question that we get a lot of the time is about red light versus near infrared light, which is better, which is more effective. You should have the exact frequencies. Um, they're a little bit different. Red light doesn't penetrate as deeply. It's still beneficial, though, because of indirect stimulation. So red light, near infrared light, to be honest, there's going to be a few little differences, but the, the net effect is not that significant because of, again, indirect stimulation. So what can we conclude? Well, we can conclude that near-infrared lamp saunas do provide the wavelengths required. That's one of the knocks against it, but they do provide the wavelengths required. There is no debate about that. We can conclude that cumulative dose is just as important as the power density or the irradiance. Cumulative dose. We can also include that indirect stimulation is another natural way of getting near-infrared light. In fact, in the paper, um, one of these papers I referenced, they said that going for daily sun sessions at the beach is essentially a photobiomodulation session. And the fourth thing that we conclude is a photon is a photon. Near-infrared light is near-infrared light. It doesn't matter how it's applied. So if we consider the title of Tim's video, in all fairness, I really appreciate the video that he put together because it does clearly demonstrate a lot about power density or irradiance but it's not accurate enough in implying that near-infrared saunas are not a good, that are not a source of photobiomodulation. I'm clear that they are not as good of a source as photobiomodulation or as quick of a source as photobiomodulation, but the cumulative time effect was overlooked, and I want to set the record straight so that people can understand clearly how and why near-infrared lamp saunas work. If people have questions, and I'm sure I'm going to get all kinds of questions and possibly negative comments and all kinds of different things, but if people have questions or comments, by all means let me know. I'll get back to as many as I, as I can or are relevant. I just hope that this really clears the air and people can make very good use of their near-infrared saunas for what they are and also recognize what they are not. Until next time, keep well.